so sadly, I've got to, uh, to break it to you guys. The Flintstones is fiction. I'm sorry for the bad news. Dinosaurs died millions of years before humans. And I also want to screw with you on one other level. So, um, you know, and maybe this will be bad news to you or not, but if, uh, if we are a perfect representation of the United States, then about a third of us believe that we evolved, we and other living, living things evolved due to natural processes. Um, about a quarter believe that a supreme being guided evolution. And then about another third think that we existed in, in our present form since the beginning, right? So that we just were created as we are, right? So if you take a look to your left and to your right, <laughs> chances are you probably think one of the other three of you is a little crazy, whichever way that goes. But we're not going to focus on that so much. Um, we're actually going to focus on a, a very small subset within that, right? So we're going to be looking at young earth creationists. So not just this idea of, of, you know, of the creation of humans, but of a slightly smaller, shorter, different timeline. So, um, so young earth creationists. Everything, their cosmic creation on exactly October 23rd, 4004 BCE. <laughs> Not October 22nd, October 23rd, 4004 BCE. So it is amazing what can happen when you cram 4.54 billion years of Earth history into 6,000 years. You get unicorns, you get dragons, you get giants and monsters. You get to even imagine, I don't know, the Egyptians in battle riding on velociraptors, right? Um, and the proof around this, the proof that they, they use in the museum um, is, you know, dragons, St. George and the dragon. Anyone read that? That's, it's like an old 11th century story. Um, uh, that is still around today, right? So you, you get fiction in there mixed in with dinosaur fossils. You get uh, giants and monsters come from the biblical story of the Leviathan, but they also come from the 12th century poem of Beowulf. You get unicorns, which are mentioned in the Bible, but actually a, some people will say that it's a mistranslation and that it's not actually mentioned, but they say because it's mentioned in the King James Bible that it... Um, that it's proof that, uh, you know, that extinct rhinos are the same thing as a unicorn, right? So fascinating, obviously. fascinating, obviously. <laughs> um, because, I mean, look at that rhino. The, these two look, they're, they're pretty similar, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's a small handful of PhDs, tons of books, you know, a half dozen natural history museums, including the one that I'm going to talk about, which is one of the largest or is the largest, um, and just an outsized educational reach, which is part of what I want to get into. So we got to step back, talk about genre for a second. So <laughs> let everyone get caught up with, yeah, a little upsetting. <laughs> um, so genre. Um, so the idea around genre is, you know, we use genre expectations all the time. We, you guys walked in here and everyone's hanging out, laughing, enjoying themselves. No one's going to stand up in the back and start singing randomly and no one's going to like start clipping their toenails in the back, right? That's only acceptable in the subway. <laughs> um, so we have expectations, right? So something, a movie like Sausage Party, it's, ba you know, it's, it's plays off of the expectations of an animated kids movie, right? It's got like the song and the dance and all of that stuff. The Onion plays off of the expectations of a newspaper and comedy comes out of that. Um, you know, starting to go a little bit towards the nefarious, there are advertorials that take advantage of you expecting to trust a magazine and hide ads in editorial content. Um, on the far more nefarious, you get into Alex Jones, who kind of pretends at investigative journalism, right? And talks about how, and tries to put together evidence that Sandy Hook was fake and that, that families are crisis actors. And then even further, you get into crisis pregnancy centers where you have 
we have these facilities that pretend to be medical centers, right? Um, to, uh, yeah, to do people in. So, uh, so all of this stuff is based on this idea that, that language is constantly evolving, right? That we have these kind of structures of language, and, but it's always changing and always getting pushed at. One of my favorite quotes is by Roland Barth around this. In a text, two edges are created, an obedient, conformist, plagiarizing edge, and another edge, mobile, blank, which is never anything but the site of its effect, the place where the death of language is glimpsed. So the basics of that is that anytime you create, anytime you speak, anytime you act in something, you are being obedient to rules in some way, right? But you're also pushing at it just by participating in it. And every time you push at those boundaries, you're, you're killing the language that you're, pl you're playing a part in, but you're also recreating it. So language is always shifting, always changing, right? So yes, so the sausage party is the death of language, right? Is the <laughs> conclusion of that. So genre, um, basically out of that, genre is a stable for now communication, right? It's something that is stable enough that we can all, we all know what it is. You know what a rom-com is, right? You know. You know what the ending is. What happens at the end of a wrong poem? Hey, that's nice. Why do we ever watch them then? Yeah, because we enjoy the process. It doesn't matter. It's comfortable, right? Um, but they're always, always getting pushed at a little bit too. So the form is always getting pushed. Um, you know, you enter a natural history museum and you expect research-based exhibits. You expect placards, dioramas. You trust in those things. You trust when you walk into these things. Um, it's efficient. It's how we know how to act in the world, right? Um, so, back to us hanging out with dinosaurs. I mean, it's, it's fun, right? I mean, it's fun. Who doesn't want to live with dinosaurs? Um, you know, and they're in pop culture ever, already. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're available. They're, they're ready to mingle. So why not bring them on into everything, right? And who wants to think about billions of years? That is it's hard to wrap your mind around it, right? So, you have smarter than a high school biology student. Big Bang, about 14 billion years ago. Earth forms, about 4.54 billion years ago. Um, asteroid kills off about 70% of life, the beginning of the end of the age of dinosaurs, 65 million years ago. Uh, around that time, mammals looked a little bit closer to pizza rat than they did to us, right? <laughs> Um, something like us evolves in six billion years ago. Homo sapiens, or us, right? 300,000 years ago. Uh, the last major ice age, 11,000. And then the first mass-produced booze, cheers, drink up, 9,000 years ago. And, you know, one of the arguments um, that's interesting to look at is, you know, is whether or not booze and, uh, and farming, which both came up at the same time and were kind of the beginning of, of us all collecting ourselves together. We didn't decide to hang out together in big groups until we had booze, you know? <laughs> All right. So they have a, they, you know, they, they punch above their weight. They've got an outsized presence. You know, they've got um, half a dozen young earth museums. This one is by far the largest. It's just outside of, uh, outside of Cincinnati, just south of Cincinnati in rural Kentucky. $27 million goes a long way in the hills of Kentucky. Um, and uh, and it, it served 400,000 visitors in the first year, and it's been steady numbers since, right? In uh, 2016, they built a $100 million Ark Encounters. Um, it's like a football field and a half wide, and it is massive. Um, and it's a full-scale replica of Noah's Ark. Um, complete with dinosaurs in cages. <laughs> Don't think the unicorns actually made it into that one, though. For some reason, the unicorns aren't at that exhibit. But a million visitors in the first year and a half. And tax credits and land grants and all of this from the state of Kentucky. <laughs> So um, an anthropologist took a look at the Creation Museum, said content in the Creation Museum is, pre is presented as a way to speak to science in its own terms, right? So, um, so 
you start, how do you start to do that? How do you start to speak to science in its own terms? Start with the architecture, right? It's start with something that is beautiful, that replicates something that is comfortable and knowable to us, like a natural history museum. Um, 75,000 square feet, gardens, zip line, petting zoo, fossils, movie theaters, uh, food court, animatronics, education focused, kids, kid friendly. Um, but the basics of this, right, is that you adopt the symbolic forms of science and you just leave the science behind, right? <laughs> so, a couple of pictures. That's St. George killing the dragons. So, so, you know, impressive, cool looking exhibits, a big place, beautiful place, and, you know, adopting those symbolic forms, but dropping the science. And they even actually rewrite the term science. Creationists love science. In fact, the word science means knowledge. Did you all know that? Science, that's, that's all science means. <laughs> We're doing a whole lot of sciencing in here right now. So, so uh, you know, this erasure starts to begin, right? Science is no longer a method of investigating the world. It's, it's just the quest for knowledge, right? So, um, and they, one of the terms that you'll see throughout it is there are two different kinds of science, observational science and historical science. Observational science is the bad science, or is the good science, because it's what you can see right in front of you. So us sciencing here. But historical science, where you're thinking about what happened in the past and, and extrapolating through research, is the bad kind of science, right? Um, so the, uh, you'll actually see a lot of flat earthers talk about the same thing, the observational science piece. So this opens up a world of possibility for them, right? You tear down this idea of science and now you can build it up any way you want to build it up. So their approach to information and learning. Um, Ella Butler calls this approach conspiracy theory epistemology. You start with a conclusion and you only accept facts that support it. That's fun, <laughs> who doesn't want to do that? Researcher PJ Wendell calls it 19th century object-based epistemology. So this one is, you think about the, like, museums of curiosity in the 1800s and it is where they pull objects out of their context and they present them you they ask a question to make you wonder and then they give you their answer which is usually ideological like europeans are the best right or um i don't know what are some of the 1800s uh ideologies right they're pushing an ideological view of things so um this is an example of it, right? Of the object-based epistemology, um, object-based approach. Can you tell how old this fossil is? Fossils don't come with tags on them that tell us how old they are. We have to study. Um, we have to study the clues to find out where, uh, to, to try and figure out their ages. Using the Bible as your starting point, see if you can figure out how old this fossil is. <laughs> Strip away all of the context, provide the answer, right? Um, by the way, the answer for, can you tell how old this fossil is? It's the same answer for every fossil in that museum. It is from 4,000 years ago from the flood because it wiped out everything, right? So that is the answer. Um, so no matter where they're, they're, they're sitting, right? No matter what strata they're in, no matter what's around them, it doesn't matter. So, um, you know, when you get to keep those symbolic parts of science and remove the science, all of this stuff is, is fudgeable for you. You want to keep Rodinia? Sure, why not? Let's keep Rodinia. You want to keep Pangea? Absolutely, let's keep Pangea. So you've got these single continents that break up into another single continent inside of this year that break up into the seven continents all inside of the same year. It makes things very comfortable. All the animals can go two by two and get in because it's all connected and they just have to walk across the land, right? But then, then you're stuck with the question of how do they get back to the places after it's broken up under the flood, right? Anyone have any suggestions? Helicopter. Helicopter, that's good. <laughs> A boat? They, what's that? Magic. 
Magic. Magic. Hey, that's a good one. Teleportation. I mean, you have unicorns, right? <laughs> so, rafting. Of course. So the flood wiped out a bunch of trees and they're all kind of hanging out together and you get onto the raft, hopefully not with a T-Rex or a Velociraptor, and you take that to wherever you're going, across the Pacific, wherever, right? So you also get dragons, right? Because dinosaurs are now dragons and who doesn't want that? So were dinosaurs dragons? Yes. Of course, of course they were. Obviously. Obviously. Lots, lots of dragons. You get anatomy textbooks. You get history textbooks. You get astronomy textbooks. Someone, I hope, I want to hear like an astronomer's explanation of this. With the speed of light, we kind of lose most of our stars up there, right? Um, okay, so. They have about 300 plus self-published books, children's curriculum, history, philosophy, anatomy, history of science. Um, almost all 300 books are written by the same six or seven people. They are prolific, like 300 books inside of 10 years. Um, and yeah, it, I don't know if you saw that. That is Noah battling a T-Rex in a Roman Colosseum. <laughs> Right? <laughs> yeah, I want to see that movie. <laughs> they even have they have a magazine and they even have what they what they call a peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I asked my research librarian in my university about this, and she reached out to a bunch of people. Librarians are the best. <laughs> and, uh, and, what, uh, and, and she got back to me and said, I talked to a bunch of people, and they said, tell the professor not to publish there. It is not a legitimate publication. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, summing it up, how do we fight this disinformation, right? Hell if I know. Be better at recognizing good sources. Wikipedia does not count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question your sources, read more slowly, better engage our experts in policy decisions, um, put people in high level positions based on experience, not our gut. Um, trust expert consensus, knowing even knowing that it's ever-changing and flawed, accept the fact that it's ever-changing and flawed. Um, but we've also been strayed wrong by that before, and it seems very anti-American, actually, right? To, to put that kind of trust in something outside of yourself. We are a whole group of observational scientists here, right? Um, so, so who knows? All right, so if, if fighting it is going to be a little difficult, right, and maybe a little fighting against culture, what is the other cultural opportunity here? Let's do the other American thing. Let's figure out how to capitalize on Woo! it, right? <laughs> so find a community that you want to rewrite. And everyone got one in their mind? All right. Learn. <laughs> Learn the terms that mean the most to them. Redefine those terms to fit your purpose and repeat them constantly, bigly. <laughs> <laughs> Write new conclusions based on facts that fit your purpose. Um, use personal attacks and alternative facts to, to back all of that stuff up. So if you take over a community's language for long enough, it will become what you want it to become. So that's my advice for how you take over the world using genre. Thanks. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.